I'm Nat, and I am the head of community at an organization called Exceptional Individuals. I see a lot of familiar faces, but if any of you are new to the group, we support those who are neurodivergent. So those with dyslexia, autism, ADHD, dyspraxia, any people who process the world in a different way to the majority of the population. Now, we normally talk about this from a Western perspective, but we all know that autism is worldwide. So how does it look around the world? How do different cultures interpret it? Uh, is everyone on the same page at the moment? I mean, I'm sure you can guess the real, the answer is no, we're not all on the same page, but do we know what page we're currently on? At EI, we work with a lot of corporate organizations that have kind of bases all around the world. And we have to tailor every single workshop we do, depending on the country, just because not all countries use the same terminology, the same language. Not all countries have the same level of understanding or where they are on their journey as a society. So these are just some of the things we're going to be looking at today. We specialize, as we said, with the four big ones. But today we're going to be focusing on autism. It's such a big subject. It just didn't seem right to slice them all into together. So we're going to be working on autism solely today. So as I mentioned, here's what we do. We support people. I guess it's always worth mentioning that our team is 80% neurodivergent. So we speak from experience, myself included. You're in good hands, as well as being students, a lot of us in life as well. Now, each week we record our webinars for those who would like to re-digest it at a later time or those who could not attend. And we try to get the really long webinar and we cut it down so we get to the most succinct version of it as possible. The last one we did was dyscalculia in pop culture, but we have a whole wide range of them. All we need to do is pop onto YouTube, type in exceptional individuals and fingers crossed we come up and you'll get to see a whole library of webinars that we've delivered previously. They range from the history of autism, the science of dyslexia, uh, pop culture and ADHD. It's a really wide range and they're all delivered for people who are neurodiverse. Everyone's allowed to attend, but it's tailored for people who have other ways of processing this world. Now, where the, today is going to be far more of an academic subject than what we typically are used to. And as such, I want to assure you that these aren't just my opinions. These are ones that have been thoroughly researched. We've used a number of research materials today, but the key one we've used is culture and autism and pathological perspectives on the US, Korea and South Africa. Now, though this book does focus on the US, Korea and South Africa, we are going to mention other parts of the world. But these are areas that there's been a particular amount of interesting research recently. And this was by Richard Brinker. And I also like to do a couple of definitions to make sure we all have roughly the same definition. And I think, to be honest, this is more useful today than any day, because one person's definition, even if you use the exact same words, isn't going to be the same definition for someone else. So when we talk about autism, we are, going, we are talking about autism spectrum disorder, ASD. I prefer just saying autism. For me, it sounds more approachable, more friendly. It has less negative connotations. But just so you know, I am referring to ASD. It can also be called ASC, autism spectrum condition. It's neurodevelopmental, which all it means is when the brain is developing, it develops in a slightly different way to the majority of the population. And as such, you kind of get a different outcome on how the individual might process the world or kind of relay information. It's characterized by deficits in impulse control, sensory regulation, ability to initiate and sustain uh, same social interaction. Though that's like a very kind of front facing definition, but I think it's important to start with at least. Now for this, I would like you to, I think you can put a little pin or you can say where in the world you think there is currently the least understanding around autism. And this isn't to name and shame. This is just so we get a better idea 
maybe we can even bust a couple of myths along the way. And bear in mind, we've only really been researching autism to a decent extent for like 100 years. It is still relatively new when it comes to the study of it. So we've got a lot of people who think maybe mid-Africa, we've got uh, the Middle East, interesting. I want to say China or Russia or maybe Vietnam, not sure. Is Indonesia? I probably did a few wrong countries, but most no one has essentially said develop uh, Western countries, which isn't surprising, but it is interesting. Oh, Anna Marie says, so excited to be here. Woohoo! Everyone in my family is neurodivergent. I am also a culture slash medical anthropologist. Oh, wow. Very relevant. And lecture in community and human services and public health. And Priscilla, uh, Priscilla says from London, creative designer and researcher, also really interested in the topic. Starting to get myself manager changes career. Brilliant. Well, it's so good we've got a really relevant audience today. And this is a fascinating area. And there really isn't enough research in this area. Don't get me wrong, there was some research, but I was expecting way more considering it's so interesting. People often ask me, how is it different around the world? And I can normally give it from a perspective of Western countries, but looking at other countries is really fascinating. So autism societies exist in about 100 countries that we know. And all we mean by society is a bunch of people who have similar interests or are connected in some shape or form that are working together. So about 100 countries are actively doing pioneering research in the field of autism studies. And some of the biggest groundbreakers at this moment, and some of these might be surprising to you, is Taiwan is really cracking at it. India has doing lots of research at the moment. The Middle East, and I know one of you thought that maybe the Middle East is a little bit behind at the moment. No, they're doing a lot. Mexico, Venezuela, and many more. And on this little map here, all the countries that are in blue are the countries that, to the best of my knowledge, are all doing active amounts of research in autism. If you know any of the other little white countries that you know are doing autism, I'd love to hear about it. Please do tell me. But as you can see, people are actively learning about it, but maybe they're coming at it from a different perspective. Oh, yes, Anna's here. Great to have you back, Anna. From London, I am diagnosed with ADHD and are waiting for an ASD diagnosis. I am running a nonprofit community organization. Well, that's awesome. So now we know that research is happening. What are we learning from this research? What are the data and the number and the stats and the facts actually telling us? Why do you think the world is now taught taking an interest, an active interest in autism? I ask this because let's face it, autism hasn't been the hottest thing on the agenda for ever, but now it's picking up steam a little bit. I don't know if you were surprised that there were over 100 countries actively researching it. I know I was. And then you have to ask yourself, why now? Like, why does India care? Why does South Korea want to get their foot in the door? Maybe they're doing it for the good of humanity, but normally there is always like other things going on under the hood that we may not always be aware of. We've got awareness is growing, but still a long way to go. And so a diagnosis. Yeah, I agree. So maybe they're feeling like we should push it along a little bit. Perhaps it's pharma, pharmacological, so essentially for medication. It is. Do you know, I think it costs about a billion dollars in order to get a medication from idea to market. It's ridiculously expensive. I don't know if because autism, you don't need medication for, I'm not sure, but it's definitely possible. Better quality of life. Yeah. There's, I think there isn't obviously an exact reason, but we are know that more and more people are, are being diagnosed with autism. That's a fact. And maybe this is something 
we want to utilize maybe um what we used to classify as disabled or needing additional support is kind of being reevaluated now we've got other systems and supports in place essentially there's so many things which without reasonable adjustments would be counted would be count as quite a severe disability but now we've got things which can support us like certain elements of technology and trained professionals maybe it's more just an alternative way of navigating your life I know for myself, I was considered fairly disabled when I was younger. Nowadays, I just need a little bit of extra time and a computer that I can speak to. We've got a comment here that says there is more research about brain, nervous systems, polyvagal theory, social media helps with advocacy and sharing information completely. Neuroscience is at an all time high. People want to understand the most complex bit of kit in the known universe. I think the technology and the collective interactions are being affected so we can observe more people struggling with mental health and social behavior. Really interesting. Lisa has says, because the DSM, that's a diagnostic system, um, uh, manual for mental health, and we are gonna be talking more about that later, so do not worry, the fifth edition, changed the criteria such that Asperger's is now included and became that is realization that actually neurodiversity is more common and thought. Yeah, maybe it's just because people didn't really think it was worth researching because it wasn't that prevalent, meaning particularly common. So remember, autism used to be like one in a million, one in a hundred thousand, one in a thousand, then it was one in 100. And I think to this day, most people say it's about maybe one in 50, one in 55. So the amount of people who are in a group who are likely to be autism is, you know, it's, it's, it's shrinking in terms of like how likely or, or growing. And is this because of injections? Is this because of bad parenting? Probably not. Definitely not. 100 percent not. But it's still worth asking ourselves, where is this rise coming from? So if you can see here, a lovely little diagram, this is about mortality, so death. But trust me, like, bear with me. So child mortality rates per 1,000 births, and, and this was over, like, since the 1960s to 2012. And essentially, the higher the number, the more babies that were dying. I know, sorry. But as you can see, as time is going on, less and less child mortality you know, it's dropping dramatically. This means that children are getting healthier. But how does this relate to autism? Autism wasn't killing kids. Oh, but the reason why this is relevant is people always want to make the world a better place. However, how can you spend money on autism when people are dying of AIDS or like tuberculosis or, you know, um, food poverty, or maybe like water sanitation. These things, you know, are like dire and we need to tackle them straight away, but we're getting them under control now. That maybe leaves a bit more wiggle room for us to put money in other areas and to start the research. It's a common thing. It's not the amount on, like when we make the world healthier and increase medical uh, well-being, then, like, then people have less children, but we live longer. So it, it is really a great thing. Oh, Anna Marie says, glad to see Romania is blue on the map. This is where I'm originally from. Oh, nice. I actually been there and I love it. Beautiful country. Please let us know your organization's website and how we can join. Well, it's exceptionalindividuals.com. Cara says, I've always wondered if neurodivergence is also evolutionary. It's probably projecting, but obviously women are now finally getting diagnosed. Do you know what? Maybe that's out of scope for the day. But I believe it is an evolutionary advantage to be neurodivergent. And before we kind of think, oh, where, where is he going with this? Hear me out. You know, if you think about it, how do mankind evolve and develop? 
Well, you always need that person to kind of go out of the box and push it a little bit. Neurodivergence is a different way of processing the world. And cognitive diversity has always helped lead the way to technical um, evolution. Why then do we see it as a disability? Well, we've created a world where it has become a very disabling factor. If you think about it, we were never meant to write and read. It is a creation that that humans created. And as we create this new invention, we disable the whole part of the population who were dyslexic. It is kind of interesting to see. I think it was always part of the plan, but, you know, for another day, maybe. So here is another lovely picture. And these are nations with epidemiological, oh God, read it please, um, data. Now, epidemiological data. This is essentially medis, uh, med the med a field of medicine which deals with the incidence, distribution, and outbreaks of diseases. Uh, and I know you think, oh, autism, let's not put that in the same bucket as kind of outbreaks and diseases. It kind of does go there, though. No one's saying it's a disease, but it's the same departments that typically research it. So in the UK, we're, uh, we have a lot of data around this. The US has a lot of data, Australia, more of your Western countries typically are running this. And what they do is they like to, they, well, they don't like to, they map about how it is changing over time, the prevalence. So are more people being diagnosed with autism or are more people becoming autistic? Are more people like growing it? Like, is there a correlation? It did, like, for instance, this world event have an increase, like kind of seeing the links. And I know all of us are like, well, autism is something you're born with it. A lot of us see it as just part of the brain. However, we don't really know without a shadow of a doubt. So until we do know, research is needed. And I know there's also an argument about developing a cure. I'm not for it, but I do think no harm in researching, you know, because then we can better understand the brain. Uh, but different countries, different societies, different cultures are on a different journey. And as we will find out very shortly, the name of what we call autism has one of the biggest impacts to whether or not we see it as something that needs treating, curing, supporting or championing. Uh, who would have thought? Jean Claude says there's a really interesting book on the topic called ADHD a hunter in a farmer's world. That sounds really interesting, but the title says it's all, said it all. I'll, I'll definitely make a note of that and check that out. Thanks. So true or a lie? Tell me, are these true or are these false? The symptoms of autism are universal. So what do we mean by that? You know, when you look at the criteria of what makes autism autism, is this the same around the world? Then we've got autism is the same everywhere. So if you're French with autism or from Canada and have autism, would it be the same? And prognosis and trajectory differ across culture. So what do we mean by that? Well, we mean how likely is it and you know, how it like moves around. So what do we got here? The first one, the symptoms of autism are universal. And interestingly, no, well, actually, no, it's a lie. The symptoms are so, so different. We talk about a spectrum when it comes to autism and a spectrum, obviously, you can be anywhere. And autism is just the name we give for a set of characteristics which are more similar than not. You know, the old expression, you know, one person with autism, you know, one person with autism. So. The symptoms are different. Now, where I see one of you said it's true, maybe it's when we're looking at how we diagnose it, we have made it more black and white, but there isn't a sure test for autism. It's a lot of it, you've got to watch interaction, see how people perform and know a much fuller picture. Then you've got, is autism the same everywhere? No. It's not. You might think, well, of course it is. You know, people in other countries, you know, we're not different species. Of course, it's the same. 
Well, autism isn't just a neurological condition. It's also a societal condition because depending how your society treats you and responds to you has a massive impact to whether or not autism is something which is a hindrance to your life, a something we just forget about, or something which we actively search and we want in our company because they're the next like massive code breaker. It really depends where we are. And the last one is, is it the same on how we essentially diagnose and follow the condition? Kind of. I mean, most countries are very consistent with how they see how things like move around. But there isn't. A lot of countries will kind of agree on one way of doing things, but that doesn't mean there's complete buy in. So I want to ask you now a question about what is culture. And this is a difficult question because culture and autism, like they're so closely entwined. We often talk about it in terms of a neurological point of view, like how the brain is wired different. But if culture was, if we all had the same culture, I think autism would look very, very different. So let's try and define culture. I know it feels like you're back at school again, but um, it's good to know because there isn't a wrong answer for this, by the way. So anyone want to share what is culture to you? OK, we've got a shared identity amongst a group of people. Nice. The way people think, understand, leave and respect each other. I like that. Traditions and views and beliefs that someone grows up with or that a particular area has. How society is organized and reflected back to us via um, expressions, life. Really interesting. I mean, oh, it's so hard. I was thinking it was what makes us human, but then I understand Ocarus has culture. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, that's the true. Culture, animals can have culture, maybe even plants can. It, it really is an interesting one. But the way I understand it, it's the beliefs you come up with, that kind of like shared group, like a community. We talked a bit earlier about societies. I think culture is more embedded to who you are. And a system of symbols, relationships. Yeah, I would. Assumptions. Yeah, it's a good one. I mean, you can interpret this positively or negatively or neutrally from many different viewpoints. And it's quite difficult because obviously our world is becoming more and more multicultural, which to be fair is a great thing. But if the world is becoming more multicultural, are we changing our processes, our understanding and our systems to reflect that? No, we're not. You know, teachers are teaching the same way they, they have for many, many years. And yet the people they're teaching are looking a lot different, but not just looking different, you know, having different kind of beliefs and culture embedded in them. We need to take culture seriously and we need to take culture as one element of understanding how we can get the best out of someone. So a quick definition time before we get on to the next patch. Asperger's syndrome. I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of this. Asperger's was a way of diagnosing a sub almost a subtype of autism. However, in 2003, no, 2013, they got rid of it and they condensed it into ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. Now, the way Asperger's was diagnosed was a form of eye autism with mild or no impairments to the individual's capability to use language. Um, you might have called it high functioning. And a lot of people still go by the term Asperger's. But it wasn't particularly helpful because a lot of people weren't getting diagnosed because they didn't meet that exact criteria. So once they kind of blodged them together, more people was diagnosed because it allowed for more flexibility on what the spectrum was like able to contain. But Asperger's syndrome is a it is a cultural name. You know, originally it came about in Austria from Hans Asperger's. 
Did you know, though, that he actually didn't found Asperger's syndrome? I believe it was a person called Lorna Wing. Uh, she took his research and kind of honor- gave him the honorary name of having a syndrome named after him. He has a controversial history, but you can check that out on our YouTube. But really interesting. So now we know what Asperger's means from a Western perspective, and we now know that it's no longer used, we've kind of created different cultures in the autism world. We've got those who were diagnosed pre and those diagnosed post. Some people will resonate with having Asperger's and others will say, I don't have Asperger's. People will say, it's not a real thing. Others will say, of course it's a real thing. We give ourselves these labels, but labels are made up. But the way that our body responds to how it's wired or what's going on inside it are real. And they stay the same regardless of whether or not uh, the name of the condition has changed. Things like dyslexia or ADHD, they've all changed over the years on what they've been officially called. So knowing that Asperger's syndrome is no longer diagnosed, is it still real? No, can I, sorry, sorry, Matt. Can I sorry to Oh, there you are, Fazana. Okay, sorry. how are you? Not so bad. Um, I, I was looking at the previous slide where it says no fear. What's the no fear got to do with Asperger's? Oh, typically people with um, Asperger's will have a lowest uh, like fear tolerance or a higher fear tolerance. So, for instance, they're not as scared by external factors, maybe like a roller coaster or a spider. Um, I'm not saying it's true for everyone, but I have seen a similar thing myself, actually. If I can uh, add something to yeah. it, um, I've noticed in and I've heard lecture about this, uh, especially um, uh, it was about women, but probably it's universal. So people might put themselves at risky situation. Um, some people might, you know, like even consume alcohol or drugs or, you know, like not be aware of the risk like walking like through the park at night or like engaging in some risky relationships uh it's quite general but it's higher with people with uh asperger oh no that's really interesting thanks and i know this from from personal experience Oh, well, I mean, I know myself, I, uh, my mum would always say I have no fear and she was terrified to let me go out of her sight, <laughs> but you know, they will be. And I see here, uh, Pris- Priscilla, uh, said, what do you mean by real? And I think that's a really good question. And this is a bit of a, uh, a, it is a bit of a question, which is meant to make you think what, uh, so was Asperger's syndrome real? Well, It was real at the time when people were being diagnosed with it. And is it real now that we do not diagnose with people with it? Yes, because ultimately we have these kind of labels that we give people to either help us, to support us, to make it easier for uh, doctors to gauge us. Or even though that's no longer the case, people still have an idea. If we say Asperger's, they have an idea, it's more clearer the way that the autism affects you. Or it might be part of a community. You know, we some people in the autism community call themselves Aspies. Um, some people hate it. Uh, and it allows you to form like a, an identity. Now, some people do not want to have their identity attached to a condition, but other people are like, it's so heavily ingrained into every fiber of who I am that I cannot possibly separate it. And I think it's, it's a personal thing, really. But was Asperger's real? It was, because if enough people believed in it, then it was real. So enough people resonated with it that it became part of the culture. And I think even though it's no longer diagnosed, it will still be used for many, 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 many more years to come. It takes a long time before people stop using certain terms. I'm trying to think of another example. Um, Think of... uh, the Conservative Party in the UK, we call them Tories. Now, they haven't been the Tories in a very, very, very long time. That was like the old party name. But even though that name's not the official name anymore, even the Prime Minister still calls them the Tories. So like some names, even though are out of date, will long continue 
just because it's become part of like the common lexicon, which just means language we use. Anna Marie says, a tendency to be more literal, impulsive, and trusting can easily be taken advantage of by other people. And that is true, actually. Uh, like I so said, with autism, it's not good nor bad. It's great in certain situations, a bit problematic in other situations. It's more like highs and lows. So we took a bit of a detour here. How, why does this matter? Well, it matters because depending on what we call the name, it has a massive impact on how we support people. So Asperger's syndrome was used originally because autism was so stigmatized that a lot of people did not want their children to be diagnosed with autism because that would mean of low intelligence, that would mean bad parenting. So Asperger's syndrome was a really great way to say, no, 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 it's not that type of autism. It's the good type of autism. So more and more people got it. And then years later, as it got a bit more accepting, we're like, well, now we've got like two different like key groups and the middle people, they're not getting the help they need. Uh, so difficult. That's why they joined them up again. So as culture and society changed, the name became useful, not useful, not useful. And ultimately, all a label is, is something which is meant to be useful. And this is why some people do not have diagnosis, because even though technically they may have a lot of the conditions or characteristics or symptoms that we've mentioned, if it's not useful, why would people bother using it or, or kind of get it? So what is culture? In a nutshell, Culture is the idea, customs, and social behavior of a particular people or society. And we're all part of a culture and society. Diagnoses are continuously reframed in different historical periods. And this is really true. You know, autism used to be essentially schizophrenia. Uh, you know, it used to be ASD. It used to be, uh, there were some really offensive words, to be fair. And they might have been useful at the time, but they are forever changing. Will we still call autism, autism spectrum disorder in the future? I don't think so. I think we'll change it again because the word disorder is problematic. We'll just have to wait and see. New frameworks are not necessarily advanced over the old ones. And I really want to focus on this a lot because you know how I told you Asperger's is no longer used and ASD is used. Because ASD is seen as the newer one, we automatically assume that newer means better. No, it doesn't. Newer just means it's more like fit for purpose or used at that moment in time. It, Asperger's was completely useful when it was in its like prime use, but it changes over time. So just because we change something doesn't mean that the old one is completely irrelevant or wasn't useful then or even now. I still think it's a useful term. So uh, as my mum would always say, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So here's a quote from the Surgeon General. He's like a top dog in the US. And every now and then, he does a comprehensive scientific review document, which typically is quite groundbreaking. This is the person who makes the big choices. So in 2001, he says culture is a concept. So a concept is something we've created. It didn't exist if we didn't create it. Not limited to patients. Clinicians, essentially doctors who actually do medical stuff and service systems, naturally immersed in their own culture have been ill-equipped to meet the needs of patients from different backgrounds. At first, this sounds a bit confusing, but if we're really breaking it down, all we mean is that it's not just patients who have culture, it's also the people who diagnose us, people from different backgrounds. Let's say you're a white doctor and you're diagnosing a uh, black young girl, some of your like internal biases and things of your upbringing, your views are going to have an impact on how you view them. When we're looking at like uh, how we diagnose people, we normally go by clinicians who have a vast amount of experience. But do you ask yourself what experience do they have? It's all their experiences was young white boys and suddenly they get someone who looks very, very different 
maybe their experience is going to be a bit jaded and not have the same, it's not going to be as relevant. So it's really interesting to know that we all stigmatize, we all have bias, even some of the best doctors around. So you always want to find the person who's most relevant to you and your culture or have an understanding of your culture rather than just the person who has the most qualifications or the fanciest sounding name. So a timeline. Here's a quick timeline on just how much autism has changed. So started off in 1943, Leo Craner did the first public uh, paper on autism. So essentially, he's the father of autism. There is a far more depth history of autism, but that's done in a previous webinar. So check that out if you want to catch up. From there, we then had the first manual of autism. It was first included. However, it was seen as schizophrenia. Now, interestingly, the characteristics of autism were the same, but we kind of put it in with another category. We weren't really sure where to put it. We thought it was really un uncommon. So was it autism? I don't know, but it looks very different. If you, look, if you have autism and you read the DSM-1, you wouldn't probably recognize yourself in the definition of it. Then number two came along in the 60s and autism was not mentioned. We've moved on. It was defined very, very narrowly. Um, so to be honest, not particularly useful. And then again, they've updated it. So we are continuously redefining what it means, not because the actual condition changes, but because we have to ask ourselves, is it actually useful? What's the point of having a diagnosis if there's no benefit to it? So the DSM five is the most up-to-date one. It's a hefty old book. I wouldn't recommend it for light reading. In the UK though, we use the, um, we use the World Health Organization's international clarification. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but essentially the NHS does not use the DSM-5, but the rest of the world does. So it's important to know that they're sometimes a bit out of sync. The UK one now does, um, now has gotten rid of uh, Asperger's as well. But for a long time, they kept Asperger's while the US one got rid of it. So bear in mind again, officially, we're not just talking in like little subcultures. Officially, the definitions are different depending on who's your kind of local authority. It's really interesting. And it also makes it really difficult because we are becoming more and more international. It's like you might have relied on help your whole life. You go to another country, suddenly you don't get any help, or it could be the opposite. So here's the father of autism, Mr. Craner. In 1943, he constituted his description of autism. But what do you think his patients most resembled? So these are a picture. We've got a black gal, a white boy, or a maybe Chinese or Asian gal. And it's really important to know or to ask yourself, when he was coming up with the definition, when he was doing all his tests and research, the, who did they look like? Because we're still quoting him today. If you've come to my previous webinars, you'll notice we use this bloke all the time. But you've got to ask yourself, is his definition, though it was instrumental like back in the 40s, does it still hold up today? Well, it was the boy, by the way. So for his research, when he did his initial paper, which defined autism, all his participants were all male. Not a single female was taken into account. All his participants were all white. Not a single person who had a different shade of skin or pigmentation. All of the kids came from educated backgrounds. They were all, you know, well-defined. All of them were middle class, you know, they had money, they had that background. And even interestingly, four out of the 11 children who he initially did his research in were all children of uh, physicians and like medical professionals. So is it really that accurate? You know, when we're looking at today, it's, um, it's not surprising that a lot of people do not get the support they needed. Has the criteria been updated in the books? Absolutely. Does that mean 
all uh, medical professionals and other people in society have an up-to-date knowledge of what autism is in 2022? No, it doesn't. And why is that a big deal? Well, these ideas, like for instance, those who were white and middle class had autism and, you know, or, or Asperger's and they were seen as kind of better. Those who didn't meet the criteria were just seen dumb and stupid or uh, it wasn't good. There's this uh, term called refrigerator mother. It's a really interesting documentary. Um, if you research it, it, it's really interesting. And essentially, there was a time when autism was considered a failure on the parental side. So it meant the mother was cold, distant, didn't hug them, didn't love them enough. You were a very cold parent. And it obviously, it's so, so wrong. But because they use that term, even today, it's still affecting parents. Really, really interesting. That still affects them. And refrigerator mother, you know, because only mothers brings up children already, that's really outdated. Refrigerator meaning cold, not cold at all. And you'd also notice there was a high, if you were black and autistic, it was more, more people assumed it was due to bad parenting, whereas if you were white and had autistic children. So racism, sexism is unfortunately embedded into autism, even today, no matter where you are in the world. Now here you'll see autism is on the rise. Oh no, you know, why? Why is autism rising? Um, feel free to like put in your words here. And you can see here that no matter what race or background or color or what, whatever you wanna say, it is becoming more and more prevalent. But if you see white people are, they're, they're rising, but not as heavily. But those from what we'd call minority backgrounds in the UK are rising, rising, rising. And that's, yeah, recognition. Uh, we've got, Tala says, I imagine it came also from autistic mothers who had uh, flat, fat, non-expression ways of communicating, not cold at all, but assumed by all. Yeah, I could agree. So we know that autism is on the rise and we know people from minority backgrounds are rising high faster than anyone. That's a good thing because autism has always been the same, but we haven't always diagnosed people who didn't look like Kana's original description or understanding of autism. Now, this is a different one. This is prevalent of autism from socioeconomic status, essentially how rich your family are. So, you know, you've got like low, low, middle, upper class. It's outdated, but we still use that term, particularly in the UK. So poorer children, though are getting diagnosed more and more, still get diagnosed about six months to a year later than their peers who come from a more privileged background. Why? Well, because a lot of the characteristics of autism, if they come from a very well-off family, they can't possibly bad be, be bad parents. So it must be a condition. But say if you come from a background that doesn't have as much money or like a minority background, people automatically assume you're a bad parent. It's due to the people you hang out with. You don't have the right influences. So it's different assumptions. I mean, I really could go into depth with this, but it's the same old story we hear time and time again, but we've got to keep on saying it. So a quick one, what did you grow up knowing autism as? Did any of you have like different names for it that you grew up in your culture? I grew up knowing myself as high functioning. And I know, I know we don't use that term anymore, but that's what I grew up with. Uh, so it's really interesting to know what different people called it. Maybe they didn't call it anything for you. Maybe they just said it was an intellectual disability. It was a brilliant, insightful presentation. So grateful. Oh, no, you're very welcome. I, uh, I'm glad you're enjoying it. So any answers on this one? Anyone had any different names which they were called by? Special, yeah, classic. Remember when they thought special was a nice word? No, it's not. Stop calling us special. <laughs> I'm not special. Oh, I am special, but you know, brilliant. Um, I was a naughty brat. A bit different. A bit different. different. 
Thanks, Rosanna. Yeah, different. We've got mental disabled, mentally disabled. And apologies for using this word, but people used to call me like, you know, retarded, like, and spastic and like horrible, horrible words like that when I was younger. And it, it wasn't even done as a slur. People used it in like common language. And we're talking people who are quite a lot older, to be fair, um, but they still use those words. And they said it so casually as well. Useless, nightmare, loud. And these words are, you know, they're not nice, but they're important to remember how far we've come and changed. Using politically correct words are one thing, but for having them to come natural takes a lot longer. Hard work, hard work. Yeah, um, hard work, difficult. Um, difficult. Um, I, I always got called the classical, boys will be boys, just because I was a bit of a scallywag. I'm like, no, uh, but now we know that's pretty sexist. Slower to acquire manners, restraints. So what name would you least likely to be diagnosed with? So these are some names, right, that are actually used still today. Parental childhood. So essentially, adults who act like children. Madness. You're actually mad. Or you have a brain disorder. So I want to pick which one, which... Would you be so proud to say that you had autism if it was officially known or colloquially so by your local peers known as any of these? Three? OK, let's see what we got. Oh, madness. Yes. Would you want to tell your friends, your family, your teachers that you were diagnosed with madness? No. And it is an actual term that people use. So the name of what we call something has a massive impact to how we resonate with ourselves and how other people treat us. So here we are. Just to prove you, I wasn't lying. Clinicians will not record a diagnosis unless the term is meaningful or useful. And this is what we should know. If it's not useful, you're not going to get diagnosed with it. However, other people will come up with a name with it. So a Navaha, Navaha, a uh, Native American um, community in the US, tends to classify autism as perpetual childhood, just meaning that you never grow up. Some people might like that, other people would not. Imagine trying to be a working professional and knowing that your condition is you're forever a child. People would use that against you all the time. In parts of rural India, clinicians call autism Pagwa, the Hindi word for madness. That's not nice, you know, and it's kind of ingrained I now. I think it's pronounced Bargain. Oh, thank you. I, I had no idea. <laughs> that means, I think that means um, mental. Mental. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, mental madness and yeah. not great. In rural South Korea, the term brain disorder is used. And again, like I wouldn't consider myself to have a brain disorder, but for them, remember a lot of these words, they're not used as a slur. It's just the word they use. But with these words, it does mean there's a correlation between the terminology people uses and if it's positive, negative or neutral to the amount of research and the amount of disclosure that happens in dead countries. Oh, nice. Teller says the Maori word for autism is wonderful. I love that. That's much nicer. <laughs> what is driving social change how is society changing and what is pushing us forward because these for instance they wouldn't have got rid of aspergers and changed it to just asd if there wasn't something pushing the movement or the names forward we would still be calling autism madness had we not changed and you may have noticed a lot of the time we say in rural backgrounds unfortunately there's a link between being in a rural background or community lack of education, outdated terms. It is Takiwanana for it. Oh, I saw, I understand. So sorry, it's not means wonderful. It's Takiwanana, it essentially means time and space. I heard of that. Um, I can't pronounce it, so apologies, <laughs> but I have heard that autism means time and space, which is pretty interesting. So what is driving social change? Well, Child psychiatry, people are talking about it. It now has its own department in the 50s. So from the 50s onwards, 
remember, 40s, it was officially diagnosed, or well, officially came up with the term. 50s, we've now got people actively researching it. In the 70s, it was starting, at least, to be deinstitutionalized. And this is a big deal. People like us were mad. We would go to the insane asylum. We were considered as a mental illness. So finally, in the 70s, you weren't zapping us with electric prods. We were being seen as human beings. Then in the 90s, we're doing advocacy. People are like, you know what? I'm black, I'm gay, I'm straight, I'm female, I'm autistic. You know, it doesn't matter. Autism is different. People are standing up for it. And in modern day, the disability rights. In the UK, in 1991, we officially got rights. And other countries may not have them, but they're finally getting somewhere. But I just want to ask, finish on any questions or statements or anything that any of you would like to add before we wrap up for the day. Okay. Oh, we've had a question about women diagnosis, and no, they are not different. They are the same, but they shouldn't be the same because the way autism presents itself in your gender is different. Females tend to be more introverted than males, and it seems odd that we're judging them or examining them from the same exact point of view. James says, unfortunately, the word for autism in Arabic is translated to lonely. I realized later when I grew up, it's not a mental disorder. I'm just lonely in how their brains are then I was oh god it, it has a massive impact oh Anaria this was so awesome the neurodiversity movement is very exciting thanks again you're very welcome thanks so much because of social camouflage yeah really really interesting oh here we are how do you feel oh. Nat, can I add something regarding uh, diagnosis in UK yeah please do uh, because I'm like um right now in the middle of it and I asked my GP a year and a half ago and they, he sent me first to a ADHD which I knew already I have but it's like okay it's helpful to have confirmation but um, what I would suggest to others who would be interested uh, in diagno official diagnosis I know in some countries in UK we can get diagnosis through NHS I'm originally from Poland. In, in Poland, you have to go to private psychiatrists. So there are differences in different countries. But what my suggestion would be to anyone who is interested is to really be aware of your rights. There is a um, right uh, to choose uh, law in UK and you, you have a right to be referred um, to specialist. And the other thing is to do like, my, I, I think... My experience is that we have to, I had to do micromanagement because it took me a year and a half until they sent my referral to right place, year and a half nearly. Um, so now I'm in West London and finally my referral went to learning disability team and in different places, it's different system, different, you know, place is... Um, doing the assessment um but uh, my suggestion would be to be like your own advocate and ask for support as well and also check if the things are done mm -hmm. because otherwise i would wait even longer because this year they sent my referral to mental health team rather than learning disability team so it was very frustrating and sometimes pe people are very patronizing some professionals so Please, like, fight for your rights, I would say, and ask for support in appropriate kind of charity services. Thanks, yeah. Anna. So, so true. It really is. Just to quickly power through these last ones, the question says, what are, about what you said about people who are less well off getting diagnosed later? Do you know if there's any research on their ability to access services and advocate for themselves? I can't say about studies that particularly relate to autism, but there are definitely studies that relate to that in general. And yeah, they do have less access because typically they're in a less, a less affluent area, meaning that the services won't have as good facilities, meaning that quality um, doctors and professionals will not want to work there. So it does have a trickle down effect. Okay, quickly, I think my question got deleted. How do you feel self-diagnosing is affecting the culture of autism or how autism is viewed? Well, I think it's two-sided. Some people feel self-diagnosed kind of dilutes it. 
But I think that's not true. I think self-diagnosis is massively helping the communities that need the support and recognition that autism, the label has a lot. So we know that people from minority backgrounds are, they get less help. If you go to someone and say, I resonate with being autistic and they're still willing to give you the help, which they should, then it's a good thing. I'm all for it, but um, I understand why you've got to be careful. You, you do have to be careful. And I think there's nothing wrong with saying you resonate with being autistic, but uh, yeah. How do you feel self-diagnosis is affected? Okay, yeah, answered, nice. But just so you know, next week, oh, sorry, sorry, Chantel, I didn't see your hand up. Please go for it. Um, I've been noticing like on social media a lot when people um, with certain neurodiversities will say like, oh, like I've noticed that this is a trait that I have. Um, I've noticed that like there seems to be quite um, a defense in the comment section of people being like, nope, that isn't a dyslexic trait, that's an aut autistic trait. Or someone will say like, nope, that's not an autistic trait, that's an ADHD trait. And kind of like this sort of, I wanna say like hoarding of like what the traits can be and like it's this very strong defense of it. Where do you think that this is actually coming from? Because I, I feel like with the word neurodiversity that people kind of are willing to accept a little bit more or like I, I assume that people are willing to accept a bit more that people gen generally have more than one neurodiversity they may not be diagnosed with with all of like they might only be diagnosed with with one neurodiversity yet they might have multiple and so I'm just wondering like with the culture of, of this like where where, where where do you think this like defensiveness is coming from oh that's such a good question thank you uh, I think it comes down to the nature of human beings. We're a pack animal. You know, we love like, you know, okay, all the Christians over there, the Catholics, you know, like we love splitting people apart. And as much as community and society is a great thing, it does tend to like cut us off from other populations. You know, people with autism have always been kind of like victimized or seen as less than. Now we are kind of taking ownership of it. We don't really want to share you know, if someone just wants to muscle in, you're like, no, 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 you weren't here when it was hard for us. You can't be here when it's good for us. So I think it's kind of like that. I also think it comes down to the fact that as these conditions are such individual, we talk about our own experience. Well, that isn't how it affects me. It definitely affects those people. So it comes down to a lack of understanding. You're an expert in your own autism, but you're not an expert in autism in a general sense. But we all know about co-occurring conditions now. Things are fluid. You know, it's unlikely you'd have just autism. Typically, you'd have other things. Uh, I like to think of them personally as not separate conditions. But, you know, it, neurodiversity is a different way of processing. And it's kind of like a pick and mix. Um, but you don't get to pick. <laughs> and it's like, all right, that'll do. And then you, the name you resonate with typically is the characteristic which has the biggest impact on your day-to-day -day life. Uh, because remember, diagnoses are only given if it's useful. And a lot of the time, I am definitely, I definitely have dyscalculia, but it's just not useful because no one knows what it means. So I'm much better off just saying I have dyslexia solely because it has more benefit to the culture that I'm embedded in. Our next webinar next week is how to get diagnosed. And bear in mind, I can't give exact answers, but I will give you as much options as I can from the amount of different perspectives. Uh, so it's going to be a really interesting one. And this is already really popular just because people have no idea. Obviously, I come from a UK perspective, but even if you're from outside of the UK, I still think you'd really benefit from this because I'll try and keep it as broad as I possibly can. But do know that the names and terms might be a bit different. Know that our YouTube channel is here and you'll see all our lovely videos. We have a lot of them now. And you know what? They aren't quick. They, a lot of them are 40 minutes to an hour, but hopefully nice and digestible and done in a way which is really easy for us all to understand. Future webinars. Okay, great. We've got how to get diagnosed next week. Then we've got comorbidity of neurodiversity, June the 9th. On the 16th, we've got am I synesthetic? That's a really interesting one. Those are people who can kind of taste color and see it, really interesting. We've got a brief history of hidden disabilities. So we're branching out a bit more and we're not looking at solely neurodiverse. We've got the science of ADHD and drugs. That's gonna be a controversial one, but you know, not afraid. 
dyslexia across culture. Essentially, that's going to be like a repeat of the day, but more focused on dyslexia, autism and sex. So how does autism actually function with females to males? Uh, we have so, so many. Uh, so I, rec- I really recommend you check them out. And if any of you want to get involved, we have a little humble community on Facebook, which is for those who have autism, where they share opportunities. Just type autism opportunities on Facebook. I'm trying to make this as useful as we can. And lastly, here's our details. But I really hope you found today useful. And thank you, everyone, for the lovely feedback. It's always nice. Cool. Bye, all.